Marty Russell and I'm a, a surgical oncologist. I have no disclosures except for the fact that I am a surgeon and I love to operate, but <laughs> only in the appropriate setting. So the objectives for my short talk this morning will be to, to review some statistics which will, not be, which will not be new to you guys, discuss some relevant anatomy, we'll discuss surgical options, and then I'm going to evaluate the liver-directed options that surgeons are um, involved in. So the facts, as you know, ocular melanoma is a very rare cancer. Unfortunately, 50% of the patients with primary melanoma will develop distant metastases, um, and because there's no lymphatic system, these spread hematogenously, and the liver becomes the site of metastatic disease in 90% of these cases. Unfortunately, um, the median survival once you develop metastatic disease is pretty poor, um, from two to five months with a one-year survival between 10 and 15%. There are many predictors of metastatic disease, including the basal tumor diameter, ciliary body involvement, transcleral extension, epithelioid uh, um, morphology, high mitotic rates, extravascular matrix pattern, and chromosomal abnormalities. So we have a bunch of different treatments for liver metastases, and we've extrapolated from the liver metastases that we treat for other types of cancer, um, colon cancer, breast cancer, um, cutaneous melanoma. So I've listed a bunch here, which I'm going to talk about the first one and the last one, which are surgery and hepatic perfusion, and my colleagues will talk about the remainder of this. So first, a very um, brief anatomy lesson for those of you guys that uh, aren't so familiar with the liver. I saved you from any um, intraoperative pictures this morning since I figured you would be eating breakfast. <laughs> um, so as you guys know, the liver lives in your right upper quadrant, protected by your rib cage. And we're going to go a little bit over the anatomy. So you, there's an anatomic and a physiologic distribution of the liver. So you have the left lobe of the liver, which is about a third of the volume, and then you have the right lobe, which is about two-thirds of the volume. This is important. This is your inferior vena cava. So the inferior vena cava brings all the blood back from your lower extremities back to your heart, and it actually runs behind the, um, behind the liver. Then you have your portal vein, and the, the, the liver has a dual blood supply. So um, about 75% of the blood supply comes from the portal vein, and this brings really um, nutrient-rich blood from all of your intestines to the liver, so the liver gets first pass at all of these. Your second blood supply is your hepatic artery, and this has a similar um, branch distribution, um, and this brings um, you know, the arterial um, oxygenated blood to the liver. And then you have a third system with your bile ducts. And as you can see here, this is your gallbladder. And then your bile duct comes up, and it divides into the right side and the left side. Um, the liver is divided into nine different segments of the liver. Um, and each of those is supplied by various branches of the portal vein, which you see demonstrated here. As you can see, the um, inferior vena cava runs posteriorly. And the liver doesn't have any connections with the inferior vena cava posteriorly, but what happens is, is the blood flows out of the liver via three hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava. And so as you can see here, you have a right, your middle, and your left hepatic vein. And so this basically tells you the inflow to the liver and the outflow from the liver, okay? So that's important for, um, for surgeons and for um, interventional radiologists. All right, so what factors go into surgical resection? So as a surgeon, when patients come to me, I look at three kind of different groups of, of factors. So first is the patient factors. So if a patient comes to me, they have to be able to withstand an operation, right? Their performance status is something that we use to determine if they can withstand an operation. And those are things like how much time do you spend in bed? How much time do you spend on your recliner? Do you go grocery shopping for yourself? Are you able to climb up a flight of stairs? So all that kind of global health factors into that because if I have if I'm going to operate on you I need you to be able to recover adequately and surg surgery for the liver is um, is a difficult operation to go through and then we have the technical factor so this is the can the surgery be done and those factors that go into that are as we discuss the inflow and the outflow so if I have to take all three hepatic veins can't I can't do that because in your blood your liver doesn't have anywhere to drain to I also have to have the ability to get negative margins, meaning that when I take a tumor out, I have to be able to take out the entire tumor or tumors and not leave a microscopic or a positive gross margins. And then we can take out a lot of the liver. So in a normal um, patient who has a normal functioning liver, you can actually take out 80% of the liver because the liver regenerates. Um, that's one of the great things about operating on it. 
So it's not so much how much I take out, though, it's how much I leave, and I need that liver to be a healthy liver so that it can regrow. And then you have the biology factors. So technical factors is can it be done, biology is should it be done, and those are both very important factors. So when I look at biology, I want to see how many tumors do you have, what's their distribution, are they in both lobes of the liver, are they in one lobe of the liver, how big are they? Um, the next thing that we think about is the disease-free interval or the timing. So unfortunately, as you guys know, um, liver metastases can happen in the first five years or they can happen 20 years later. And so the problem is, is how long has the patient been disease-free? In other words, did they just get diagnosed at six months later and they have, you know, 50 liver metastases? Or were they diagnosed 10 years ago and they come in with just a couple? And so that um, plays a big part in the biology of the disease, how aggressive it is. And then you have to think about extrahepatic disease, and this is disease outside the liver. I'm not going to talk so much about that today, um, but I think Dr. Kahn has some, um, some slides in his talk about that. But basically, if I'm doing surgery, I need to be able to get all of the disease out and not leave anything behind. And so if you have disease in your liver and somewhere else, that is um, a little less favorable. So I did put in a couple of more technical slides. This is a very busy slide, but this is on surgical resection. And as you can see here, ocular melanoma and cutaneous melanoma are combined in some of these. But if you look at the treatments, so these are studies comparing surgery to other treatments, and these are non-comparative studies. And so when you look up here, you see that patients that can undergo hepatectomy have a much longer median survival than patients that cannot. All right, and this goes for patients who get no surgery, patients that get chemotherapy, um, sy systemic chemotherapy or best supportive care. And as you can see here, if you can undergo a hepatectomy, the median survival is pretty good, 23 months, 14 months, 21 months, 25 months. So these are pretty consistent across the board. So I did put a couple of studies up here. These are recent studies. So this is um, a study that looked at nine ocular melanoma patients and then some cutaneous melanoma patients and those patients who underwent liver resection. As you can see here, the cutaneous and ocular melanoma patients have about the same survival. So when you're looking at these curves, this is overall survival, okay, here, and this is how many months they survive. So this is percentage that are, that are still alive. And the median survival is 29 months. When we look at disease here, so remember I talked about surgical margins. So an R0 resection means that all the tumor's out, okay, both when I look at the tumor and when the pathologists look at the tumor. And so this is kind of a no-brainer. If you get all of the, all of the disease out, then it, patients do better than if you leave microscopic disease behind. And as you can see here, same thing, overall survival versus survival in months. And if you do an R0 resection, that has a 44-month median survival compared to only 12 months if I leave disease behind. So that's why it's really important for me to make sure I can get out all of the tumor. And then this is um, the other curve from this study, which looks at major hepatectomy, which is usually defined, remember I showed you those segments of the liver? So that is usually defined as three or more segments of the liver. And these, in this, um, Oops, this is a little bit controversial because this gets reversed in some of the other studies. But these patients who underwent a major hepatectomy had a longer survival than patients that underwent a minor hepatectomy. This is another diagram showing you the liver pool um, melanoma experience, and this was just published uh, in 2014. And the, one, the thing that I want to focus on here is they looked at high-risk melanoma patients who were under surveillance, okay? And if you look here, the number is 218. And the reason that surgeons are not always involved in, in ocular melanoma is you come down here and you look at this, only 17 of those 218 patients were able to go, undergo surgery. So while it's a good treatment, unfortunately, for um, whatever reason, did they have unresectable disease? Did they do a laparoscopy? A laparoscopy is when instead of taking you to the operating room and making a big incision, I just make a little baby incision, a couple of baby incisions, and look inside because I need to see um, if the disease is resectable. So the problem is, is what we see on imaging is not always the same as what I see when I actually go in there because mm -hmm. the disease is very small. And part of the problem is, is that the imaging is actually not able to pick up really small disease. So I go in, make a small incision, look, and if I only see one or two tumors that I went in, that I originally was going in for, that's very different than if I go in and I see a liver full of tumor. Um, and so as you can see here, that happened in 33 of these patients. So a small number of these patients were able to undergo resection. 
Now, if you are able to undergo resection, then obviously you do better than if you're, uh, if you're just going to palliative care. So this is the same type of overall survival versus months. And in this study, they used ablation, which Dr. Keyes, I think, will talk about in his talk as well. And surgery is often combined with ablation. We often work together for, um, for tumors that are um, in both lobes of the liver. I'm gonna take out part of it, and then we're gonna burn the rest of them. And as you can see here, overall survival much better than patients who can undergo surgery and ablation than the patients that cannot. And then the one in three year survival, as you see surgery and ablation 100% in this group um, versus 31% who could not um, undergo surgery. This is a big problem. So this is a, um, a big problem with doing a big, sur a big resection is that a lot of these tumors come back. And so that's another thought process. And that's one of the things that we use that disease free interval that I talked about to, um, to discuss. Okay, so overall, surgery median survival of between 14 and 24 months compared to three to 12 months without surgical care. So if you're eligible for surgery, then it's a really good treatment. Um, the problem is, is that only about 10% of patients are actually eligible for surgery because they come in with a poor performance status or too many tumors or um, a, a poor distribution. So five-year overall survival, 19 to 39 months, and obviously, if you get all the tumor out, you do better than if you, if you don't. So that's why we have to think very carefully about patients. As I discussed, recurrence is a big problem with surgery, um, and that's why we think so hard about patients who need um, liver resection because, again, I need to get all the tumor out, and sometimes that's a guessing game. I don't have my crystal ball. I don't have the scan six months from now to know if, you, if patients are gonna develop additional disease later on, but it is a problem. Um, in general, surgical resection is very safe. Um, the, in the studies that we looked at, the 60-day mortality, so the chances of dying in 60 days were between 1.9 and 2.3 percent. Our mortality um, at Emory is less than 1 percent for this. Um, and complications were, were historically um, 15 to 20 percent, and I'll tell you that major complications now are much lower for surgical resection. Um, something that just for you guys to, talk, to think about when I was showing you all those curves about survival and not survival, you have to realize those two groups of patients aren't equal, right? So if I'm taking a surgeon, if I'm taking somebody to surgery, it's a select group of patients. Um, and often they have less disease um, and they've been disease free for longer. So it's not apples to apples. Um, and then some studies combine surgery with other treatments. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit about non resection surgical options, which is kind of a crazy thing. So um, hepatic perfusion is, you can do this a minimally invasive or an open technique. Um, and I'm going to talk mostly about um, the percutaneous or the minimally invasive technique. But what this does is it allows us to isolate the liver and give high doses of chemotherapy directly to the liver so that it's less systemic toxicity. The liver gets that high dose and, and gets um, adequate treatment. And so this is what um, an isolated hepatic perfusion looks like. So this is an open procedure, so big incision, go in, you put a cannula um, at, the in, at the inferior vena cava, so your heart sits right here, okay? So you have to block off this area because you don't want the, um, the drug to go into the heart, so you block off this area. And then surgically, you isolate, um, put a cannula in the in, um, cava, and then you also put cannulas in the, um, in the inflow to the liver. Um, big open procedure. Um, we're going to look at just a little bit of data from that. So this is the, um, the one study. This was 34 patients. Um, 30 of them were under, able to undergo this perfusion. But as you can see, those patients that are able to undergo perfusion do better than patients that don't. Now, this is a, a big operation, and um, it can be associated with complications. And so 20 of these patients did not have complications, but Four patients got sick, um, septicemia, which is basically just infection. A couple of them got pleural effusions or fluid on their lungs after the, after the surgery. Um, but they did have a good response. 68% responded radiographically. 12% the tumors went away. Um, and the time to progression, so that's another important factor is that you look at is we get all the disease out. When, does the next, um, when do the next tumors come about? And that was seven months. And again, 68% developed extra hepatic disease. Median overall survival was 24 months. So an improvement in survival from what we saw in those patients that were getting best supportive care. I want to talk a little bit more about this. So this is a percutaneous hepatic perfusion. 
So basically what you do is you go in, and this is um, something that's done with the help of interventional radiology because, remember, I told you I like to operate, but I use pretty big incisions usually, and Dr. Keyes can go in and percutaneously access these things, so just with small incisions, small catheters. And so basically what you do is you put in devices that come up and go into the hepatic artery here, and these are just done with very small catheters and then you have an outflow catheter here, and then you use this balloon right here. Remember I showed you the inferior vena cava? So you put that inferior, that balloon up there so that the hepatic veins drain into this area, and there's, a set, there's two balloons, so this balloon keeps the chemotherapy from going systemically or back to your heart and the rest of your body, and then this, um, the chemotherapy comes out these catheters, and then it is recirculated back through another vein. All right, so the chemotherapy goes in, comes out, goes through this filtration device, and then goes back in. So this is a randomized control trial. So this is, um, is um, like our gold standard for trials. And this was um, published just in 2015. And this, they look at hepatic progression-free survival. So what is that? That's, again, how long till more tumors come or till the tumors get bigger. And so for this, you can see that those patients that underwent hepatic perfusion had a much better um, progression-free survival than those patients that didn't. Now, this trial was interesting because you always have to ask what was the design of the trial. So instead of patients getting either perfusion or best supportive care, they actually let them cross over. So if you got best supportive care and you develop more tumors, then they let you get the perfusion. Okay? So that's why this graph, which is the overall survival, doesn't show any improvement in survival because it ended up that most of the patients in both groups ended up getting perfusion. Does that make sense? So the hepatic, the, per, the chance to get more tumors was much better, if you, uh, much better if you got the perfusion than if you didn't, but because almost everyone in the trial ended up getting the perfusion, there's no difference in survival. And just to show you guys a little bit, these are um, some pictures of a scan. So this, you can see the tumors here. And then this was nine months after, um, after the perfusion, and there was very little tumor that you can see. So this was a great response. And then this is basically all the um, studies that have done on hepatic perfusion. So not very many, right? Um, but as you can see here, the median overall survival range from about 10 months to 12 months. And then this is just another study that shows you all of these things are liver metastases. And so you can see why I wouldn't want to operate on this, right? Because I can't take out, I can't leave enough liver, it's too widely distributed. But if we can perfuse the liver, then the tumors go away. And so that's a very nice radiographic response. Okay, so we are opening up, <laughs> um, and I don't, I don't want to say too much about this, but right now we're going through the, um, the Institutional Review Board to get a hepatic perfusion um, trial opened at Emory. Um, Dr. Yushak is the primary investigator for that, so we are looking forward to that, so keep your ears open for that. So in conclusion, liver mats, unfortunately, are way too common in ocular melanoma, and we have limited um, ability to treat them surgically. Um, only 10% of the patients are candidates. Hepatic perfusion appears to be a very reasonable, um, very reasonable option with some uh, less invasive ways if we do it through the percutaneous um, access, and they do have an improvement in hepatic disease and in survival. And then we still have the problem of recurrence that we have to deal with. All right, so that is all.